<sighs> well, we are going to polish off this series on leadership and what God expects of people who want to step into that role in any sense of the term. Now, I, I'm going to say it again, and you're probably tired of me saying it by now, but um, I believe leadership looks a lot more broad than just the idea of, okay, you've got people who you're bossing around and telling what to do, and they actually do it. Um, because I believe that leadership is sometimes a very subtle thing, and uh, uh, sometimes it, it looks like influence. Um, so you, you can obviously lead people who are your employees or, or they're under your authority in some sense of the term. Um, you can lead people who are not under your authority in any way, shape, or form. Uh, matter of fact, you can even not believe lead people who are you're under their authority. Um, and, and there's just so many ways we can do that. We can we can um, give suggestions. We can get um, get do research to provide backup for whatever it is that we're suggesting. We can um, do influence. We can just be a good example. Things like that. Um, so many ways it works. But the idea is a lot broader than just hey, I'm telling you what to do, go do it. Um, but unfortunately, that's often the way it works in the world is that, you know, especially, you know, get into a workplace or maybe a military environment. And, and that's the expectations that boss tells you what to do, the sergeant tells you what to do. You go do it. Uh, and, and, you know, if you don't like it, well, then that's your problem, not theirs. Uh, so at any rate, we want to take a look at what Jesus showed us and, and see how he led because he had pretty much those 12 guys following around all the time, not to mention the occasional crowd of, oh, say a few thousand people. Um, so people were very interested in what he had to say and in, in what his life was like. <coughs> it, it's why we're still interested today. Uh, but at any rate, it, he did an amazing job. Matter of fact, yeah, I would say it, it's quite arguable that he is, um, in my mind, anyway, he's the best leader to have ever lived. So I just want to go ahead and dwell on that idea through the series. And so we, we've talked about things like last week. We we're talking about how we have one thing that the world cannot have, no matter how good a leader they are. If, if they're not a Christian, they don't have the Holy Spirit living inside, which gives us an automatic edge. Um, and, and there's so many other things. But today I kind of want to talk about the cornerstone of it all. Uh, I saw a video clip uh, of a guy, an actor, um, older than I am, but he came in, apparently he's been, I guess, in prison for a while, and came, came out, went, went to go buy something, and um, he laid the cash down on the table, and I, oh, sorry, we don't accept cash. He's like, what? <laughs> you don't, do you not see a little thing on here that says this is legal tender for all debts? Why, why don't you accept cash? Haven't you ever heard the saying, cash is king? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I haven't. So um, they got it worked out. But if cash is king in the economy, which that's not really an arguable, uh, or that, that's an arguable point at this stage, there's one thing that's not arguable, that in the world of Christian leadership, character is king. That who we are has a greater power than what we have to say. Say that again. Who we are has a lot more power than what we have to say. Yeah, I, I heard one more time. <laughs> one more time. <laughs> Who we are is a lot more powerful than what we have to say. So your character. <laughs> character is king. It is far more important to God who you are, what you're like. I mean what you're really like. We're not talking about necessarily reputation, okay? What you're genuinely like, so like on a bad day when you're drained and exhausted and come home, what do you like to the people who love you? <laughs> who are going to be there the next day no matter how well or how badly you treat them. What do you like to those people in those moments? Because make no mistake, you know, when, we're, when we've gotten a whole bunch of good things coming our way and we go home and we're in a great mood, it's easy to be nice to the people we love. And I'm not saying you know that, that's not valuable, but it's easy. Character comes out under hard times. That's when we really see what we're worth. And I think if we're all being honest, 
in those hard times when we're suffering from exhaustion, whether it's sleep deprived or it's just a hard day or it's been we've been out in the hot sun or maybe the I'm hungry. We're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Super yeah. <sweaty. laughs> Super sweaty. Or maybe it was it's just you were out in the cold. It's winter, it's dead winter, and you've been out in it all all day long and you're cold to the bone. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, we've all got our, uh, shall we say, kryptonite, mm -hmm. and uh, we come out and, and we just, typically, we just don't treat people we love well in those moments. It's like, why isn't dinner ready? Or or why didn't you clean this thing up? Or, you know, hey, you know, you had told me you were going to do this. Why didn't that happen? Or, you know, it'd be nice if I could just get 15 minutes of peace when I come home. <laughs> or whatever it is, you know. We've all got these things, and we just kind of check our manners at the door. Uh, but it, it's those moments that are important. And, and it's not to say that, you know, we, obviously we're going to have those moments, okay? The question is, when we've had a time to get a bite to eat or breathe or whatever it is we need to do, you know, when we stop and we look back, what happens from that point? Do we just shrug itself off and just go on a matter of business? Or do we give a trite apology to the people and say, hey, look, I'm sorry I was such a jerk. And then next time it's going to happen again. Or do we work on getting better? That's the question. Because like I said, character is king. And God is so concerned about who we are that the things we do are almost secondary. I mean, you, you look through the entire Old Testament, you see all these stories of great men of God and what the world tends to look at is these great men of God, but they don't read the whole story. They just hear a little bit here and there. And we usually talk about the good things. But you know what? There's not but maybe one person in the Old Testament who was a good person pretty much the whole time. And even that guy's iffy. Okay? He's got a couple character flaws, too. But you look, some of these guys are seriously screwed up. I mean, we're talking Jeez, daytime funny. talk show material. Um, there's, there's some seriously screwed up things. that if, it were, if the Bible were made into a movie, no doubt it would be at the very least rated R. And quite possibly NC-17. What is that? That's the next worst. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, it'll be three times again. Yeah. <laughs> it's been out for a while, but at any rate, aside from oh, it's good that you don't know what that is. Okay? So, anyway, uh, the point is, is that God looks at our hearts. He cares about who we are. And um, I want to take a quick look at somebody's life. There's one statement that kind of shows this, and it's kind of at a transition point. I want to kind of lay out the history for you is that um, the nation of Israel, God's chosen <laughs> people, he'd been living with them, among them in the tabernacle, and he would appoint these people he called judges, okay? And he would pick this person by hand, and it's usually somebody who's nothing special. Why? Because he wants to show off his greatness, not a person's greatness, okay? And so he keeps using these people, and... Um, Eventually, Israel starts looking around. They say, well, all of these other nations, they have kings. We want a king. And God's like, look, this is not a good idea. I'll give you what you want if you really want it, but you're not going to like it. Promise. And they're like, well, we want a king. We just, we just do. And there was a man named Samuel who was, he was the last judge of Israel. Okay? And it fell on him to be the one to go and anoint a person king. And they picked a man named Saul. And he was kingly. He was real. He was tall, dark, handsome kind of a guy. Um, athletic. I mean, he was just the ball. He would have been undoubtedly the captain of the football team if he were you know, a teenager these days. Um, and so he was all that. But there were some problems in his character. Matter of fact, I think it's quite arguable that, um, no, I don't think it's arguable. I, I think it's undeniable that he had mental problems, okay? Yeah. Um, the question is what kind of mental problems? Maybe yeah. schizophrenia, maybe bipolar. 
we're not entirely sure, um, and I'm not qualified to try to make a diagnosis on someone who lived like three, four thousand years ago anyway. So um, regardless, he had problems. And the verse we're going to look at is at a transition. They've been going through King Saul's reign. So this is the very first king that Israel ever had. And they've gotten a taste of what God had told them, that you're not going to like what you get. Okay, because like I said, Saul was, he, he was a stereotypical king, you know. If you come in, the king's in good mood, you might walk away with, with I don't know, a duchy or something. Um, <laughs> but if, if you walk in and he's in a bad mood and you yeah. sneeze the wrong direction, you know, he might cut off your head. Yeah. That was Saul. And um, he had made a mistake, one mistake too many, not uh, Matter of fact, you look look at Saul's life, and we basically um, see two instances where God told him what to do, and he did it. Okay, so he wasn't completely lost. But this is earlier on in his kingship. Later on, we see a different ratio here. So we see four times God told him what to do, and he outright disobeyed. And then there's one time where it's like, okay, what you're asking people to do is pretty darn iffy. It's not. There's not a direct command against it, but it's just not wise. I mean, like. They're getting ready to go into battle, and he's like, me and my soldiers, we're not going to eat until we win. So, yeah. that does not strike me as wise. Not unless God told everyone to pass. Maybe yeah. maybe then, because God has a way of winning battles without the help of the army. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at any rate, in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, Chapter 16, verse 7. I am a long way away. First Samuel. You guys can read me. First Samuel 16. It's verse 7. And I, actually, I'm going to back up and just read verse 1 here real quick. Because this talks about King Saul. Verse 1, and then I'll skip to verse 7. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Now, Saul's not dead. Samuel's not mourning Saul because he kicked the bucket. He's mourning because Saul is just morally bankrupt, basically, at this point. I mean, he's, it, he'd go a lot further off the rails, but he just made up his mind that he was going to do his thing, and he was going to directly do what God had told him not to do. And that's why God was done with him. And, and, and Samuel had been spending time with Saul and trying to mentor this guy and, and help him become a good king, and Saul just wasn't having it. So, move on to verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance, or hide, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You guys remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Mm -hmm. You remember that he had polio and that he, I'm not completely wheelchair bound, but he was mostly in wheelchair. What about Abraham Lincoln? You seen pictures of him? Yeah. Kind of goofy, isn't he? <laughs> wow. I'm just being honest. And, and I've heard said about both. I have a point that, that this. Both of these men, I've heard experts say that neither of these men would have been elected if they, if television had been around. That <laughs> That's probably what it should have been. Why? Because we're shallow. People yes, and it, it, we don't want to have a world leader who looks fun. Right <laughs> <laughs> I'm just calling it like it is. We are a shallow people. Israel was no different. Right. They picked Saul because of what he looked like. And, and Samuel here, he's looking at, at Jesse's sons, and along comes one who's basically cut from the same mold as Saul. He's athletic, he's big, he's all that. And that's This is what God says, I reject him. Because you guys look at the outward appearance, I look at the heart. 
we're going to look at that because God's leaders need to have character. So I'm going to go to the place, one of the places anyway, where God talks about the character uh, of his people, uh, of his leaders. Because later on, after Christ came, he established what we call the church in these days, which is not a matter of a building. It's a matter of people who typically go inside that building. It's us, okay? And so in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3, we're going to take a quick look at the guys that God calls qualified to lead. There's another list in the book of Titus in chapter 1. You're welcome to go look at that one. But it says much the same sort of thing as we see here. Well, let's take a look and let's dig right in. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'll look at verse 1. It says, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be an elder, he desires an honorable position. So an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For a man can act, manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Although an elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must be well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. And just gives us this quick outline of, of what kind of character God is looking for in us. <coughs> Because whether you have any desire to serve as an elder in the church or not, this is the kind of character God is looking for in his people. These basic qualities. Okay, so we're going to take a look at it. We're going to dig in. So, starting in verse 2, it says, So an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. You know what's weird? Is that that phrase, above reproach, is, is not a good translation because it, it's actually a term from athletics okay so the idea is back in ancient times Greek culture loved wrestling okay so I'm not talking about WWE or anything like that okay <laughs> although I guess that would probably work for the illustration anyway but it's more like what you see in the Olympics. If you've ever watched Olympic-style wrestling, it's where they're actually serious and they're doing things like half Nelsons and, and that sort of thing. And they're breaking out of holds and, and doing turnarounds and all that. And whoever pins the person wins. Well, you know what? Have you guys ever watched that? Ever seen it, whether it's a school competition or anything? Anyone? Oh, like a movie. It's a block. movie? Okay. You guys see those outfits they wear? <laughs> Not exactly stylish, right? No sleeves, so it's basically a tank top, and it's just this little unitard thing, cuts up in shorts. So one, one piece, one piece. And, and, yeah, it's, it's almost like a, what you'd expect to see in a 1920 swimming pool or swimming outfit. But you know why they wear that? They're awesome. They're awesome. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that must be it. No, it, it's because. Um, it, it allows them something for coverage from modesty. Back in Greece, they didn't wear that. They wore nothing. <laughs> so, um, thankfully, we've, we've changed a little bit since then because I would never have been interested in wrestling if that was the way it was. But at any rate, it, it's it's so that it's, it's, it's pretty much skin tight so that it's hard to grab hold of. This is the idea right here. Being above approach means that you're not giving somebody something to grab hold of you on. The enemy is trying to grapple with you. He's trying to drag you down. Guess what? If you got loose, baggy clothing on, it's easy to get, get a hold of a person. But for the man or woman of God, we can't have something that's easy for the enemy to grab hold of. We've got to live lives and make it hard for him to grab us and pull us down. Because it doesn't take all that much. And we live in a day and age where um, where secrets come out. Yeah. And what's even more is that they're never forgotten because it's on the internet forever. 
We'll usually give it a few days and they'll kind of move on to the next. Well, I'm not saying we don't forget quickly. <laughs> we do, but there's some things we don't forget quickly. Like, anyone know the name Granny Swagger? <laughs> <laughs> and we've got more recent. We've got more recent examples than Jimmy Swagger. People in the church, pastors who have built a platform that have been highly respected across Christendom, have fallen for sometimes some, just some dumb reasons. Uh, but it usually amounts to the same sort of things. Money, power, sex. Same thing that gets most everybody else. Okay, something in those realms usually trips people up. So we've got to, as, as Christians, the goal is to be above approach, not let these areas of our life become something that the enemy can grab a hold of us and drag us down. Because you know what happens? We drag other people down with us. Stop and think about the last mega church you heard of that there was this major scandal at. If you find out, if you, you can go online and find this information, what was their attendance before that happened? What was it afterwards? You're going to see a major drop in attendance. Why? Because we have this weird celebrity mindset here in America. And, and we put more stock in a person than we should. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we, we tend to look at a person instead of looking at God. But regardless, when somebody screws up, people mm -hmm. notice. When they screw up big, they notice big time. And so they get dragged down and they take other people with them, new believers, people who are just barely in their faith. They're like, this guy can't do it. I've been listening to him for three months talk about how to live a godly life. I thought he knew it all. And he just, and I find out he's been alive the whole time. And he's been a hypocrite the whole time and longer than I ever knew him. And they stopped coming to church. This happens, I, I wish I could say this only happens like once a year. This this is not uncommon anymore. I mean, and, and it's not limited to denominations or a single denomination. Catholic churches have problems with pedophiles being in the clergy. Well, you know what? So is the Southern Baptist Church. Yeah. And you know what? It's not limited to those two either. It's all yeah. over. It's, it's... We need to be above approach. Absolutely, we can't let it happen. What's Which a good is, definition is that? Right? What's a good definition of being above, above approach? Mm -hmm. It means that we live a life where it basically there's, well, kind of like we talk about marriage, right? Um, we talk about marriage and it's, well, usually in reference to guys, right? Um, we talk about marriage and like, oh, she's gonna, she's gonna uh, sand down his rough edges, right? That's what we hear a lot of. That mm -hmm. She's gonna make them a little bit better and get, sand off those rough edges. It's the same sort of thing. It's the, we're, we're cutting off the pieces of our character that are wrong. That it, it, just my mind keeps coming back to this idea of the baggy clothes. I love baggy clothes. I don't like tight shirts. I don't like tight pants. Back in the what, 2010s and skinny jeans were everywhere. No, thank you. I'm like, give me some nice loose fit jeans. That's what I like. Um, but the idea is in our character, we can't have those things that are easy to grab onto. If this is something that the world looks at and automatically knows that it's wrong, we don't need to have anything to do with it. I mean, the world doesn't totally understand that sex outside of marriage is wrong, that sex before marriage is wrong. But you know what they do understand? If you're married, you need to be faithful to your wife, which is the next point, actually. <laughs> So would you say reproach is living a life that's worthy and dignity? It's integrity. It's really what it comes down to. Um, that the you know, things that we know better, we're generally doing. None of us are perfect. If if the media or the church or the outside world is expecting perfect, then we can't help but disappoint. None of us is. That's always the standards that we are not going to be perfect. What you're reading here, it's not that you know it's we're going to be this all the time. It just doesn't work that way. None of us reaches that standard. Only Jesus ever did. Uh, but we aim for that. That's really the main thing, is that where are we aiming our life? Because what I've seen so many times is that we, uh, 
we take a moral thing and we say, okay, this is the cliff edge. And so maybe I'm gonna scoot back a couple inches here. I'm gonna draw a line right here. I'm not gonna step over that line, right? What do we do? We start getting close to it. And generally human nature says, we're gonna get as close to it as we can. And then we're gonna start leaning forward. <laughs> so I'm not stepping over the line, but I'm getting as close as I can. This is what it looks like. Mm. This is what we do. So like in terms of like adulterous affairs, it may be I'm never going to sleep with another woman. But you know, I'm going to go grab lunch with that coworker. I really enjoy the company. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying a person's company, but the question is what context is it in? Mm -hmm. And how much are you enjoying it? And what way are you enjoying it? Things like that. There, there's a lot of nuance to this. And I recognize that. But the question is, are we going to be living life to where anybody and everybody is going to be able to look at our life and say, he's faithful to his wife, she's faithful to her husband. This is the characteristics that we need to aim to have. And so, <laughs> oops. Um, but anyway, so we got to be above approach. And, and it goes on, and it says, very next thing, says he must be faithful to his wife. Literally, it means of one wife. That, that's, you go back to the original language, it means that he needs to be of one wife. So, I mean, we can go all kinds of directions with this, but the idea is that it comes back down to what you've been hearing for years now, that God's definition of an ideal marriage is one woman, one man, married, and faithful to each other in every sense of the term, the whole of their life together. When when one of them dies, that's when the marriage ends. Okay? That's what it's always supposed to be. There's lots of ways that we can be unfaithful. It doesn't it's not just a matter of having sex with somebody or kissing somebody or eating lunch with somebody, but what what's going on in your head? What's now Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, I'm not much bring this up here because I have a question. I ha I know some people that are in marriages mm -hmm. that believe because they have a relationship with, and they're married, married, with, they think it's okay to have a relationship with other marriages. And they're like, they're okay with that. That's not okay. Right. It's, it's not okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Not okay. okay. So just because they're okay with themselves, are you talking yeah. about Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah. 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 You're right. You're right. Because again, that it comes back down to that definition. But do you know the reason why we have that definition of one man, one woman, married? Do you know why we call that out? Because if you look in the Old Testament, there's guys that had, there's men of God that had more than one wife. Yeah, like thousands. Solomon. 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 Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of wives. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, well, there, there's different problems here, but it comes back down to our definition because what we're told in the New Testament is that marriage is supposed to be a picture between the relationship of God and us. So. God is fully and completely faithful to us. It's always, never fails. And the way it's supposed to be is that we're supposed to be the same way towards him. Yes. We're not supposed to cheat. We're not supposed to flirt around with the world, with, with chasing after money, with chasing after women or men or or whatever else it is. There's 100,000 different things we could put in the place of God yeah. that we could be unfaithful to God with. I mean, just seriously, hundreds of thousands. <clears throat> Whatever it is, if, if something else is more important than God, you you know, God no, you're being unfaithful. That's why the definition is what it is. It's meant to be that relationship between, to show the relationship between God and us. And so when there's unfaithfulness from either partner, 
embrace that, there's a problem that needs to be fixed. And thank God he's a God of redemption because he takes things that we think are beyond repair and he does make it even better than it was. Not always. It depends largely on how much we're willing to work with him. But that's the truth of it. So um, I want to go ahead and move on because there's a lot more to this passage. Uh, it says, must be faithful to his wife, must exercise self-control. Man, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's not a word we genuinely like. We kind of understand it because, you know, there's a whole aisle full of ice cream. <laughs> uh, we understand what self-discipline is. We just don't exercise it. I don't. It's like my pay green. <laughs> So whatever it is, whether it's we don't want exercise or whether we, you know, we want to take that extra half an hour or an hour and just mess around on our phone or read or or whatever it is that you enjoy doing, whether it, or maybe it's, you know, we play golf, but there's that, what is it, the uh, 19th hole, I think they call it, we, the place you go and we drink. Mm. It's, it's a bar there, the golf course. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like I told your wife, hey, you know, I'm going to go play a few holes. Yeah, with the guys, and um, we'll be back. You know, it's going to take us, I don't know how long it takes, four hours or something. Um, but they take that extra half an hour or an hour and just sit there and drink. And if you told your wife, you know, you're going to be back since you're done, and you're sitting there drinking, that's a problem. Okay, you've lied to her. And, and so, and, and it goes both ways. Whatever it is that we don't have self-discipline in, and you guys know we all have our areas. We all do. Um, whether it's ice cream or whatever, I don't care. It doesn't matter. We have, and again, the standard isn't perfection, but can someone look at your life and say, that's a person who understands what self-control is? That's the question. Because you, you can probably, you probably, when you think of self-control, you can probably think about somebody you know whose life is just like, man, they're so self-disciplined. They got it together. I wish I were like that. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's, I don't know, whoever. Ooh. I don't care. I think it's Kathy. Yeah. yeah. I was about. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm sure she'd take tonight. Uh, but regardless, this is important. Because it really does show how much in control we are. How much we're willing to submit our life to God. Because he's got standards for us. We're reading a few of them here. Mm -hmm. uh, but are we going to try to live our life pointed that direction? Are we going to, or are we going to get as close to the line as we can? Mm -hmm. And so maybe, worst case scenario, we fall off. The self, the lack of self discipline will often lead to that. All right. So self control. We must live wisely. That's a book of Proverbs for you. Read it. It's good stuff. Um, must have a good reputation. And I, I'm going to say right here, I think he's talking about people, among people in the church. You guys, if, if anyone's gone to a church for very long, you probably know that person who can't seem to keep a secret. There's gossip that, you know, if you're talking with them, you're probably going to hear something yeah. juicy, right? Um, there's people like that at churches. Um it's not okay. And that, that's far from the only area, okay? I'm just trying to list one example, but the whole idea is that we have a good reputation. People that we're going to church with, people that God has placed our lives together, do they respect you? Again, not perfection, but are you basically a respectful person? So, there's that. Um, he must enjoy having guests in his home. Hospitality is a big thing. It's it's a big thing, and, and um, it, it's not an easy thing. I'm an introvert, but I like being yeah. hospitable because I like having guests over. But don't get me wrong. When I'm done, I'm done. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say that. Tiny knows I almost never get anyone out. But, um, but I'm thinking it, I promise. It starts with the thought. It does, it does. It starts with the thought. But the point is, like, if your home is always closed, if you're ne or maybe, maybe for whatever reason, your home's not an acceptable place to meet, whatever re the reason is, are you willing to go take somebody out for lunch, dinner, breakfast, whatever? 
Are you willing to show hospitality in the way that you can? And remember, hospitality is not just about opening up your home. It's not just about buying someone lunch. It's about really it comes down to what are you doing to make someone feel welcome in your presence? That's the biggest part of it. Share your lives. Yeah. And if people are constantly getting the message that you're not willing to share your life in any way, guess what? You're falling a little short. And there's, a, there's an area you need to get better in. That's a big deal. It's important to God. Why? Because... He offered us a place in his home. It's obviously important to him. All right. So, uh, and he must be able to teach. Now, this this speaks, this is the only thing I can come up with in this list that is a matter of ability, okay? But it's not a matter of he's got to be able to teach well. I think the point is that he's willing to step up and do it, and that he knows enough to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. There are some things... I can get up like a lot of things in the Bible. Certainly not everything, but there's a lot of things in the Bible. If you give me a subject, I can probably get up here and I can probably talk for five to five minutes to an hour off, if I'm being serious. But there's a world of things out there. If you talk me, ask me to talk about structural engineering, guess how long that conversation is? I can spell, okay? That's about where my expertise ends. It's like I really know there ought to be some support in some way, somewhere. I don't know, Billy Squaw. So, uh, just point is, is that how much do you know? How much are you trying to get to know? How much time are you spending in the Bible? How much time do you spend with God and communion with communion with Him, praying, talking to Him? What's your relationship look, look like with Him on a daily basis? All these things are things that we can teach. It, <coughs> it's not even a matter of getting up on a stage and giving a sermon or anything like that. It's a matter of can you even just sit down one-on-one and have a conversation on how this person that you're talking to can get closer to God? That's teaching. We tend to think of a classroom or preaching in a sermon, but it doesn't have to look like that. It's do you know your stuff? And of course, how well are you living it? Because if you tell somebody, hey, you need to get better in this area, and you're a complete failure in it, guess how much you're probably going to listen to this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. All right. Um, so, um, not a heavy drinker. That one seems... It's not easy to drink. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I will say that I don't believe alcohol is inherently wrong. Yeah. When we start getting... Unless you're an addict. Yeah, well, yes. there's there's problems with that person, yes, in, with that, but we all have our areas. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but most people, beer after work, you know, I've worked around truck drivers. I can't tell you how many times I heard, I heard it so many times I got sick of hearing it. It's like, oh, it's almost beer 30, Ross. <laughs> okay. Go home, enjoy your beer. I'm not going to grudge you that. You know, it's fine. But if it's, if that, Beer leads to the rest of the 12 pack. Right. We have to have that every day. Yeah. yeah. So. Same thing with anything else. It's too much of any. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's too much of anything. We, we we can look at prescription drugs. We can look at illegal drugs. We can look at alcohol. And, and those are the ones that are pretty obvious. But it, it can be all kinds of things. Food. It can be. <laughs> yes. So it, is, it, can, it can be what? Yes. It can be any of those things. What are we addicted to? But. The idea here is that too much of these things is unhealthy. It's not that it's inherently bad. Matter of fact, elsewhere in the Bible, um, we see Paul recommend to Timothy, "Hey, you know, we know I know you got stomach problems, so hey, just, just take a little bit of wine every night. That'll help settle your stomach." So he's being told to drink alcohol. Alcohol is not inherently wrong. A little bit of a certain thing in the right context can be an awesome and wonderful good thing. But too much of anything is too much. Yes. And it can lead into problems. So that's the sort of thing it's talking about. All right? So I'm not a heavy drinker or be violent. That one seems like a given to me, but not for everybody. Um, and, and frankly, this is the sort of thing that we try to hide as long as we can, <coughs> typically. I'm thinking about, I mean, obviously, if someone's going out picking fights, you know, Stone Eagle, 
every Friday night or whatever, that that becomes pretty obvious. They're in the jail on a regular moment. But usually the family stuff, that doesn't show up very often. Amazing to me how often a family will strive to keep that a secret. And it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be happening. It's not acceptable in any way. But it says on the other hand, he's got to be gentle, not quarrelsome. <laughs> Anyone here enjoy a good fight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get me on the right subject? Yeah, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I've spent... Especially spent... Um, if a comp uh, company can edit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I've had countless what I call theological discussions through the course of my life. That was that was my area, is that, you know, if, if somebody had something they wanted to talk about, I, I love getting into that. And, you know, sometimes there's agreement and or it was a short conversation if we agreed, right? But the good stuff is where you get in the nitty-gritty details where you disagree. And, um, and so that is uh, something I, I've really enjoyed in the past. And I, I've lost a lot of my taste for it, but not all. Um, I still enjoy those conversations, but it's got to be right time, right place, right things. Uh, so. And right attitude. Honestly, that's the that attitude right is what makes it different. To me, it, the attitude what, is what changes it from just a discussion to a quarrel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Right. Yeah, that's super important. I think that's honestly one of the most important characteristics, especially when it comes to our relationship to God, is what is God trying to teach us? But we need to still listen to each other, too. So um, be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. It's kind of hard to do here in the U.S., let's be honest. No, you don't have any. Oh, but we can still no, we can trust you know, the dips no, no, with the Lord. That doesn't mean, just because you ain't got it doesn't mean you don't love it. You don't love it. No. Uh, it just means that you can't have the love affair you'd like to have with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens if you love it when you get it? You're like, yeah, I like it when I get it. Well, then it's gone and you're like, no, okay. <laughs> it looks fun while it lasts. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, no wonder I have an interest in you and anybody. So, question is, what does your account look like? Uh, <laughs> not so much stuff. What are you how are you spending your money? Your when you do get extra money, right. what do you do with it? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. But what if, what if someone came and handed you, say, ten thousand dollars above whatever your bills needed? What would you go do with it? The car, that SUV. Yeah. Buy a house, or buy a car. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those things. Land. Mm -hmm. yes, sure. I mean, go look at the double but, lots. But, <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, why don't you stick that in safety? Yes. Uh, we got those people here. Uh, someone could give me $10,000 to spend on music equipment, and I could spend it fast and be looking for more. Yeah. <laughs> I need more attendance. I want to make informed decisions. Yeah. 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 It's not a lot either. No, it's not. It's granted a lot nowadays. So, at any rate, the point is that you can't love money. Um, says he must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. Um, if you look in the uh, Titus passage, it talks about having children who believe. Um, so the idea is that you are the person at home that you are at church that you are at work and then christ is the center because you know what if christ is the center of your life guess what your kids don't generally get too interested if th this is part of the reason why church attendance has declined over the last 50 plus years it's because church was mostly for most people it was a Sunday only thing. Uh, Christ yeah. Christianity was a Sunday only thing. So I live this way Sunday morning and I get to rest of the week. And guess what? You you give that message to your kids and suddenly the next generation, it's not very, even that important to them. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you've got grandkids or great grandkids that don't care or even know about God really in any, any real sense of the term anyway. But if, if we live Christ-centered lives, guess what? Our kids are attracted to that. 
if there's significant hypocrisy, guess what? They go away from the faith. They start saying, I want to be anything but what my mom and dad was. We've got to be genuine believers at home with the people who know us well. If we're not, our kids are going to leave the faith. Our kids, you know, if, if we're able to be genuine Christians at home, our kids aren't going to have a big problem obeying us or respecting us. I'm not saying that there's not going to be exception. We know. Anyone's got kids. Anyone's <laughs> been a kid, you know. There's going to be a turf. So, we do that. <coughs> Having children who respect and obey him. For if man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? This is a big deal. This matters. Um, it, it's, it's a matter of being faithful in the small things and being faithful with more. This is the way God works. He trusts us with a little bit, and when we do well with that, he trusts us with more and more and more and more. And that, that more is going to look different. I'm not talking about that. It's easy to boil that down to dollars, but it's not just talking about dollars. For one person, it's going to be about dollars. For another person, it's going to be about influence. For another people, it's going to be about friends. For another person, it's going to be about um, what they, what influence and power they have at work, that sort of thing. It's going to look different for all of us. But it's still there. It's, it's still a matter of how are we managing small things before we can handle the bigger things. Says an elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. That's basically the same sort of idea of as being above reproach. Okay? This is why you know we make sure that somebody is not new in their faith. And frankly, the thing about Christianity is that I love is that we can grow as fast as we want to. Is that the more time we pour into our relationship with God, the more we grow up to be like him. And that can be amazingly fast. I've seen people become mature believers in less than a year. I like how you put that. Because I look at it as in the more you're deepening your relationship, the more he reveals to you um, your character that needs words. Absolutely. Uh, Not fun. It's not always fun, but the biggest thing is like when we come into God's presence, when we genuinely, genuinely experience God, we should walk away changed, or at least wanting to change. Mm-hmm. So that, that's kind of the hope I have for when you guys come to church Sunday. I hope that through the worship, through the message, you've experienced God and you want to walk away better than we walk out or walk in. Get my, uh, my words right in the right order there. Uh, <coughs> this, is, this is what it comes down to. It is becoming better, being willing to change. Um, be like him. You know, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and that takes intentional effort. And I have seen people who have been in the Christian faith for years and years and years, and they never grew up because they weren't interested. They wanted to be the same. You know what I, I found is that at no point in my t- life have I ever really, really wanted to change. <laughs> but looking back on it and how I have changed, I'm like, I'm better because of it. The, all, the things that I thought that I am like, I need to hold on to this. This is a super important. This is like life changing and important. And I thought these things maybe as a teenager or early 20s or something like that. And now I'm like 47. I'm like, that was not really very important at all. Like those uh, theological discussions I used to love, not as important to me as they were. A lot of things change. And, and, and so we kind of step into a situation and we say, okay. Look, I don't want to change. I'm satisfied with me the way that I am. God's saying, uh, no, there's better in store. Mm-hmm. And so as long as this changes the right direction, we're in good shape. Unfortunately, we can't change the other direction, too. But that's not <coughs> the point is that we, we do what it takes in order to, to become mature. So that whether, you know, I don't want to be a person who after 50 years of being in the church is the same person he was in your life. I don't want to be there. And I don't want that for you guys either. I don't want to be stagnant. All right. Uh, so 
not a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside of the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. This is another big one because it's just, they're paying attention. The world pays attention to us and we're not going to make them happy. There's gonna be a lot of stances that we're gonna take that they are not gonna like. And they're gonna talk bad about us because of those things. But if that's what God is leading us towards, if that's what God calls good, I'm not going to call it bad just because the rest of the world says it. Yes. We just are like him. We live life in his standards. But you know what I've learned is that living the life of Christian integrity and trying to be genuine and, and just love people where they're at, try to help them to the next step, you know? I mean, I haven't been here in Comanche, at least by Comanche standards, I haven't been here for very long. I don't have a whole lot of reputation, but most people who know me like me and trust me. I like that. And I don't have to worry about, you know, if I leave my phone unlocked and the wrong person gets a hold of it, and they're going to go find those text messages or look at my browser history or whatever else. I don't have to worry about that. Go ahead and ignore about stupid selfies on it. <laughs> don't do selfies. Huh? Except when I'm oh, no, I mean selfies people who got Oh, yeah. Selfies. Okay, yeah. yeah I get you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not into selfies personally. <laughs> anyway, side of the point. But the point is that they're looking out and, and they know more or less what we believe. And how are we doing? We're paying attention. a lot longer than I intended to. Sorry about that, but this is a big deal because again, mm -hmm. it's all about character. God's desperately, desperately trying to point out to us, hey, who you are matters. And it matters a lot. Matter of fact, the most important sermon in history, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's chapter five, six, and seven. That's kind of the core of the message. It's not about what you do. It's about what's in your heart. About who you are. Really. And that was, I think, the main reason Jesus had come down and teach because everything we needed, we could have gotten from the Old Testament. It's in there. But we made it about rules and regulations instead of making it about a relationship with Him and a relationship with each other. And so He had to come out. Come down and spell it out for us in a different way so that we can pay attention and we'll be able to get it. Character is absolutely key. So, this doesn't happen accidentally. It pretty much comes one of two ways. Either God's going to throw something hard at you or he's going to let something hard come your way. And he's going to throw you through that. And I promise you, that's going to happen anyway. Okay? some point in time, you're either going into a trial, you're coming out of a trial, or you're resting between trials. Pretty much time, okay? I mean, I, I hate to say it, but um, and enjoy the rest while you get it, okay? Uh, but those times of rest, and frankly, even in the trials, we can still stop and ask the question, what is God trying to teach me? What can I grow in? What area of my life is not good enough that God's working on me? This can be an intentional step. This is something you go to God and say, okay, God, what is the next thing you want me to work on in my character? And he shows you he's really faithful that way. Um, it's usually not a pleasant conversation or a present. It's not a fun revelation, I'll say that, because it mirrors are not friendly things when it comes to our souls. Um, but they're honest. And we just say, okay, God, this is the area we're going to work on. You don't have to go through hard things to get better. You can grow anyway. That's what I want for us. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I come to you and I just thank you uh, that your character is flawless. That we can look at you, we can be inspired, we can we can look at Jesus' life and see how he did it and, and, and understand that it is doable. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the way Jesus operated, we do it too. 
So I'm asking you, just show us what's next. What do we need to work on in our character next? And help us to exercise the self-discipline or, or, or a changing of, of what's important to us. Whatever it is, God, I don't know. But help us to follow you closely. It's so much better when we do. You're a loving father, and you want to guide us on this journey, but don't give us a path. And we'll be I'd like to grow the easy way rather than the hard way. So help us. We need you for it. We need you for every step of this journey. We need you desperately. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.